Hi there, this video has to do a lot with the materials that make up our planet. For the most part, the outer solid portion of our planet, this is the crust upon which we go on with our daily life, is made of different rock types. After all, the rocks we see around us are not static, they change and undergo different transformations. Let's talk today about all these changes that make a rock to be born and come to an end, just to be reborn again from the fire. Let's talk about the rock cycle. Enjoy, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. The rocks we see around us are a testament of the materials that compose the Earth. As we saw in our last video, they are made of different minerals that have a defined crystalline arrangement and defined chemical formula. Well, because of this, rocks are susceptible to change or to form entirely new rocks. Depending on their original mineralogical component, rocks are susceptible to many transformations in their arrangement, minerals, textures, etc. In their formation, rocks also exhibit cyclicity where an apparent material is susceptible to be changed into new forms or due to weathering disintegrate into its basic component particles to form new rocks. In most cases, these changes can be seen with the naked eye, whereas in some instances, different analytical techniques are needed to track and identify changes in the rocks as they occur on a smaller scale. For example, a rock's texture, that is the size, shape, and or arrangement of its constituent minerals also has a significant effect on its appearance. To this transformation, of the mineralogical and textural characteristics that give birth to new rocks, we call the rock cycle. Rocks are the most common and abundant material on Earth. We find them everywhere in many shapes, colors, conditions, and for many uses since prehistory. After all, my friends historians tell me that in our human history, we have our own stone age. So, rocks play a role in our existence and we interact with them in many ways. Their abundance and continuous existence in multiple shapes and forms suggest that there must be a mechanism whereby they come to exist. In other words, originate or be born. They may recycle or change and ultimately disappear again. But we keep seeing them around, so how is that possible? Well. That is possible because they get recycled through different processes governed by nature laws that have been operating from the very beginning of our planet itself. The concept we use in geology to track these changes that rocks undergo through time is quite a fundamental concept in geosciences called the rock cycle. The rock cycle allows us to understand why these three rocks are different, or why this one is different than this one, and even different from this one. Although they may share the same elemental and mineral composition but have a different look and physical properties. As a concept, the rock cycle constitutes a simplified but useful overview of physical geology, where processes and the resulting products of the Earth's interacting parts are reflected at each step. It also allowed us to delve into the constituent materials of the Earth before attempting to understand its evolution and the events that have shaped its history. So let's see what's that about. We must start by the definition of the word cycle. The first thing that comes to our minds is that a cycle is something that comes back to the same place, kind of something that repeats and that is orderly in a way that we can anticipate what the next step could be. Well, the rock cycle is the recurring series of events or processes that rocks undergo as a result of our planet dynamics that usually lead back to the same starting point. I know this is counterintuitive and hard to wrap our heads around. This is mainly because of two things. Because we see rocks static as the span of our human existence is far too short compared to the time required to perceive most of the changes that transform one rock into another. In addition, rocks may seem to be unchanging masses precisely because of that, because the changes required for the rocks to transform commonly take time, I mean like a lot, great amounts of time. A cycle has to start somewhere and end somewhere. How and when did the original rocks and materials that constitute all the elements, minerals and rocks that surround us, including the ones we don't see beneath our feet on Earth's crust, came into existence? Well, it started a long time ago. Check the video on the origin of our planet. I will place the link in the description below. 
However, the important thing is that perhaps these very same materials that were formed originally in the Earth's childhood and teenage years are still among us. How is it possible? Well, most of them have been recycled through time via different processes of our planet's dynamics. The Earth's crust started to cool down following the formation of the Earth thousands of years ago. As the minerals crystallized from the original magmas, the Earth's crust started to consolidate by density segregation of the minerals where the heavier minerals are at the core, in the center of our planet, becoming progressively lighter towards the outside. By the time we reach our crust, the segregation has brought together two very important minerals in the resulting composition of our planets, and more importantly to the topic of this video, the rock cycle. Our planet's crust is mainly made of silica and aluminium, two elements with a lot of affinity, and they join together with oxygen to make up the dominant mineral group on our Earth's crust, the silicates. They will be the subject of another video when we review the different mineral groups. Igneous rocks are thought to be the first rocks because they would have been the product of the cooling down of the primordial magmas to form the silicates. The main mineral group that composes them, as well as the Earth's crust beneath our feet, including the continental crust, reaching felsic minerals of granitic affinity, and the oceanic crust, reaching minerals of basaltic affinity. Their very name itself is derived from the Latin ignis, that means fire, and they constitute the skin of the Earth upon where we all live. Thus, because they are intrinsic basically related to the formation of the Earth crust, they constitute a good beginning of the rock cycle. This process that leads to the formation of the silicates that make up all the igneous rocks is called crystallization and may occur either beneath the surface, in the crust, or at the surface, like in here, following a volcanic eruption as lava consolidates. If igneous rocks are exposed at the surface, they will undergo weathering, in which the day-in and day-out influences of the atmosphere slowly disintegrate and decompose rocks. Following their formation, igneous rocks may crop out at the surface, where they will undergo chemical and physical weathering, in which the continued elements and processes of the atmosphere slowly disintegrate and decompose rocks. Continuous chemical and physical weathering of these minerals can also further disintegrate them, resulting into smaller particles, called detritus, leading to redistribution solution. Eventually, these detrital particles and dissolved substances, collectively called sediments, are susceptible to be removed and entrained into any sediment transport mechanism, such as rivers, glaciers, wind, water streams, including creeks, tidal currents, waves, and end up being deposited at the end somewhere. From their source in the top of the mountains to the places they are deposited or sinked. These places where sedimentary particles come to rest ultimately are called sediment depositional environments. In the majority of cases, as time goes by, all these detrital solid particles or in dissolution come to rest in the ocean or any other depositional environment, including river floodplains, deserts, swamps, deltas, and estuaries, among others. Next, the sediments undergo burial that will lead to litification, a term meaning conversion into rock, to form a sedimentary rock. For example, the loose sand moving on this dune as the wind pushes it will be litified into a sedimentary rock called sandstone. The depositional environments where this sand came to rest after each individual sand grain was transported by the wind is called a desert because here in modern deserts is where we see these processes operating that produce the same products. For example, the geometry and these shapes that we call cross bedding. In some instances, these particles derived from pre-existing sedimentary rocks form tiny microscopic particles that can be dissolved and together with the larger ones can be re-transported and re-deposited to form another sedimentation cycle and undergo the same processes to form again another sedimentary rock. Now, imagine that following crystallization of igneous rocks or newly formed sedimentary rocks after deposition and litification, these already formed rocks are subjected to high pressures and temperatures. For example, as they get involved in the dynamics of mountain building, like in here, the Alps in Italy, or intruded by a mass of magma, well, the constituent minerals of both igneous and sedimentary rocks will undergo transformation through time to form new minerals or rearrange under high pressures and temperatures beneath us in the 
Earth's crust to form metamorphic rocks. The word metamorphosis implies changes, whatever these changes may be. In this case, the most common changes observed from pre-existing rocks, whether igneous or sedimentary, are textural changes, reshaping or neomorphism, and mineral genesis depending on the boreal history resulting in a particular set of conditions of pressure and temperature of any given protolith or pattern rock. In a broader sense, the conditions needed to exert these changes in any pre-existing rock or mineral depends largely on the tectonic setting. We will discuss this later in a future video when we deal specifically with this particular type of rock. When metamorphic rocks are subjected to additional pressure changes or higher temperatures, they will melt, creating magma which will eventually crystallize again into an igneous rock, thereby starting the cycle all over again. However, these changes require a lot of energy, in the form of heat. At this stage, a good question to ask is, where does the energy that drives Earth's rock cycle come from? Processes driven by heat from Earth's interior are responsible for creating igneous rocks and drive the processes that result in metamorphic rocks, weathering and erosion, external processes powered by the energy from the sun that in turn impact the climate regime will ultimately produce the sediment and influence the different sediment transport mechanisms from which the sedimentary rocks form. The most fascinating thing about the rock cycle concept is that it is a witness to the fact that our planet is not a single static entity, lifeless and stagnant. To the contrary, modern geology approaches the understanding of the Earth as a system made of different parts that combined together make up for a quite remarkable complex system. The rock cycle allowed us to view many of the interrelationships among the different parts of the Earth system. It helped us to understand the origin of igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic rocks, and to see that each type is linked to the others by processes that act upon and within our planet. As many parts interact in these dynamic systems, the rocks involved in the rock cycle may take alternative paths. For instance, igneous rocks like a granite that crystallized from a magma and rather than being exposed to weathering and erosion at the Earth's surface may remain deeply buried in the Earth's crust and let's say it gets involved in a mountain building event like in here in the Andes. Well, in this case, the granite will be transformed directly into a metamorphic rock called gneiss, skipping the intermediate stage of sediment and sedimentary rock in the rock cycle. Another variant may be, for instance, that sedimentary and metamorphic rocks, as well as sediment, do not always remain buried. Rather, overlaying layers may be stripped away, exposing the once buried rock. When this happens, the material is attacked by weathering processes and thrown into a new raw materials for the new sedimentary rocks. In this case, we will form another sedimentation cycle that will end up in another different sedimentary rock. This video deals primarily with the formation, changing and reforming of three basic rock groups and how they can undergo changes, cycling back or forth into one another. These changes are largely dependent on the original mineral composition of the rock, the weathering susceptibility of its component materials, the erosives and sediment transport mechanisms, as well as the tectonic regime that will ultimately influence the burial history, temperature and pressures that act on any given previously formed igneous sedimentary or metamorphic rock. However, any rock from the three basic rock groups can be partially or fully disintegrated to form sedimentary particles or be destroyed in a subduction zone, like in here, along the western margin of South America, just to be reborn again in a place like here, the East Pacific Rise, the Red Sea or Greenland. But why in these places? I think it's time to talk about my favorite theory in the whole of the geosciences field, that is plate tectonics. A fascinating theory, but we will deal with that in a different video. Thank you for watching up to this point. I hope that you learn and increase your amazement and admiration towards our planet. Please let me know in the comment box which one is your favorite rock type and why. For instance, I feel a little bit more comfortable dealing with sedimentary rocks, but I really like some of the minerals in metamorphic rocks too. But uh, nay, I must admit that my favorite ones are still sedimentary rocks. Why? Because they have a lot of things to say and are arguably the ones that contain the animals and plants that existed once upon a time on Earth and that are now part of what we call the fossil record. And you? Please let me know in the comment box and I will do my best to answer all your comments. Don't forget forget to like, share and subscribe and I will see you in our next video. Ciao!